All right, so my sermon this morning is going to cover some controversial material in the world's eyes today. Hopefully it shouldn't be controversial for anybody here gathering with us this morning because I'm going to be preaching the Bible, Amen. right? This is, this is what we believe and, and look to as our source of truth. This is what we should be looking to, the Word of God, for everything that's true and everything that we believe should be founded on the Word of God. So um, the title of my sermon is called Let's Reason Together. Okay, and, there, and this, that's a quote from Scripture, from Isaiah, where, where you know, that's is more in regards to salvation, where he's saying, you know, though your sins be red as scarlet, they should be white as snow. But it's let's reason together. And I, I'm a very strong proponent of using, you know, reasonable arguments and things that make sense and things that are logical and in order and you can, you can provide evidence and proof for because truth and facts go hand in hand and we don't have this, you know, while we have faith in the Word of God, it's not this blind faith. And when I say blind faith, I'm talking about this faith of just like, just believe this because I say it's the word of God, even though it doesn't match up with reality, even though it's just what, you know, like, like just this, well, I'm just going to choose to believe it, even though there's no support for it whatsoever, right? God's not asking us to do that. And when things are true and right, you don't need to do that. Now, we have a blind faith in the sense of there are things that are unseen that we believe to be true. We believe in heaven and hell. We can't see them, but it makes perfect sense. There's a, you know, there's a lot of things to that. So, so I'm, I want to be careful in the way that I express what I'm preaching and what I'm saying and how I'm defining these terms that I'm using because in order to convince people of something, you need to be careful with the words that you use, right? And one of my jobs as pastor here is to teach and to preach. So I'm here to preach. I'm also here to teach. And there's many ways of dealing with the subjects I'm going to be dealing with today. And they're extremely important, especially in a day that we live in today. And the approach I'm going to take today is one of reason. And this is directed at the believer, right? Which we have a church full of believers. Imagine that. Amen. I'm not here trying to convince the world. I'm not here trying to convince people who do not believe in Scripture about what I'm going to teach on this morning. It is intended for people who already say, I believe the Bible is the word of God. Okay? So let's reason together. Before we get any further into Leviticus 18, keep a bookmark here. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter number 3. You say, well, Pastor Bersons, we're in New Testament church. Why are we in Leviticus 18? Isn't Leviticus about the law? Yeah, it is. And that's exactly what we're going into this morning is the law. And we're going in specific aspects of the law that people want to ignore or pretend doesn't exist. But they're there and they're in the word of God. And, and I'm going to cover, I'm going to try to answer a few objections that are very common that I hear about even going into this subject and why do you talk about this and everything else and, and well, what is the law for and who is it to and every, you know, we're going we're gonna to dig into that a little bit because I want, I want to be reasonable here and I want you to, I want people to think about this and think about it in a way that makes sense and I don't want you just to accept and say, well, that's just what pastor said. No, it's not a good enough reason. You're going to believe something to be true, believe it because you know it's true, because it all makes sense, because it fits with what Scripture is teaching. New Testament, Romans 6, the Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Here's one example in the New Testament that's telling us and commanding us not to sin. So the first objection, even just to going to the law, people say, well, the law is just gone. The law is done away with, right? 
why would you even go to the law? We're New Testament believers. The law doesn't apply. Blah, 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 blah. Right, right. Okay, well, the Bible's saying not to sin. If we're not, you know, if we're commanded not to sin, how can we not sin unless we know about the law? Look down in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 4. The Bible says, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. New Testament definition of sin. You are transgressing God's law. Obviously, what I quoted you in Romans 6 is found in many places in the New Testament. I will not belabor that point. Read the Bible one time. Read the New Testament one time and count how many times you're admonished not to sin. Okay, and if sin is a transgression of the law, in order for us not to sin, let's look at the law. The law of the Lord is good. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, the reason why people get confused is because there are different applications of the law. If we're looking to the law for our salvation, then you're looking in the wrong place. We are not looking to keep the law in order to be saved. So the verses that talk about the law being done away and, and not being under the curse of the law and being free from that bondage and everything else is referring to our path of salvation, of ultimately being reconciled to God because we can't be reconciled to God through the law because we've already transgressed the law. We've already sinned. We need Jesus Christ and it's only as a free gift. It's only by grace. It's only by faith in him that saves us. So when we go as believers, as Christians, to look to the law, it is not for our atonement. It is not for the salvation of our souls. And again, when you read those verses in the New Testament that people like to twist and, and, and take way too far to an extreme of like these hyper grace people who say, well, there's just no more law. Well, that doesn't line up with what the scripture is talking about then. If there is no law at all, then how could we sin? How could anybody sin for that matter? If there's no law in the New Testament, then nobody's a sinner. Because sin is the transgression of the law. It makes no sense. Sense. We have to be reasonable and look to and use our understanding and the brains that God gave us to be able to reason through these things and understand what God is trying to tell us and how we should be living according to his words, right? Without contradiction. So we look to the law so that we don't sin because we're trying not to to sin because while you may have your soul completely secure in Christ and yes when you die you will go to heaven that doesn't mean that there's no consequence for sin the penalty of hell has been paid for amen that's huge that's more important and bigger than everything else but it doesn't make everything else unimportant Right? Just because something is most important, the thing right below the most important is still important. So we don't only just focus on the one thing, and that's why you're not going to only hear salvation, 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 salvation every single time we have a service here. But isn't that the most important thing? Yes, it is the most important thing. But is that the only thing? No. There's a lot more to it than that. So we're going to go be reasonable and look through this and say, okay, well, the New Testament, I'm commanded not to sin. I'm saying, should we continue in sin and grace may abound? No, God forbid. Okay, well, let's look to the law. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is all by way of introduction. What I want you to be thinking about is how should we and how would we determine what laws should be enacted in a society today. Let's say just, just 
hypothetically speaking, you were given an entire country where you are in charge and you can make up any laws for that land that you want to make up. You say, but that's just fantasy. You know, look, let's start with this basis so we can understand what's right and wrong. And I'm going to get into why do we even go into this later? Like why, why even go through this exercise? But for now, let's go through this exercise because it's easy for people to not even think about it that much and to just start talking about, well, this is the system that we're in right now. Well, I know this is the system we're in right now. And I know that we're not able to necessarily make the changes necessary, but we still want to know if, 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 if for nothing else, what's sin and what's not sin. But we're going to go to the law because these laws are actually talking about laws of things that should be crimes versus not crimes. We're not going into all manner of sin, and there's no time to go through that. There's a lot of commandments in Scripture. But I want to look at literal laws that God gave to the nation of Israel, to Moses, about what is a just penalty for a specific crime. Okay, we're going to look at some of those. But I want you thinking, if you were in charge... How do you determine what would be a law? I mean, we have new laws being enacted all the time. And everybody in this room is guilty of breaking some law. And I forget what the exact statistic is. I've, I've read it from different places before of like how many laws you break on a regular basis that you're probably not even aware of. And the reason is just because there's so many laws that have been enacted. Now, they're not all enforced, right? But the point is, is that there's just all these laws on the book. And people complain about God's laws. And we could pretty easily identify, you know, what, what God says should be law. And you don't need a lawyer with a doctorate and years and years and years and years in study and specialty in like traffic law or whatever. And then, you know, this law and that law and that law and that law just to understand what the laws even are, which is what we have here, right? You don't have, like lawyers don't know everything about all manner of law in the country. But you know what's funny is that God's laws, you can have one person that knows about all the laws because they're not that complicated and there's not that many of them. It's really not that difficult. But what would you choose? And how would you do it? You know, unfortunately, a lot of Christians, if they were to be in charge of a country, would probably go back to Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Paine, whatever, just, just political figures to figure out, well, how should we run our government? Well, our founding fathers did this. Okay. Is that going to be your source of truth? Now, there's a lot of good things that have come from the system of government that we have, but you know what? It's not perfect. How would you determine what, to, what you're going to use as your source to determine this is right and this is wrong? This should be a crime. You would say, oh, it, I mean, stealing, right? Someone steals from someone. Well, of course, that should be against the law. And I think everybody would agree with that. You know, not stealing from people. Yeah, that sh there should be a law against that. Okay, but how do you punish him? Now what's appropriate? And if everyone's just left, if you're just left to your own whims, how, how do you, how can you solidly say this is appropriate and this is right? Unless we look to God. Because guess what? God's already given that to us. So very, my very first reasonable argument, before we even get into looking at the laws, is how about we look to God to help us determine what should be a crime, what should not be a crime, and what should the penalty be for the crime? You're a Christian, you believe God. Do you think that God has just changed his mind all of a sudden on, for example, theft? Is there any reason why we should have different punishments today for someone who steals from someone than someone who stole 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago? Is there anything inherently different in the morality of the crime? 
No. We're going to get into some of the changes to the law. Don't worry. It's part of my notes, too. We're going to cover that because there have been some changes. But let's just stick with the basics. Okay? Stealing is wrong. Murder is wrong. And you don't have to be a Bible believer to, to agree that that should be against the law. But what's the punishment? As a Bible believer, I'm going to go to what God said the punishment is. It's one of the things that we get by going to the Bible is understanding how bad is a crime. Some people, you know, stealing, when it happens to you, you may think, it's like, man, put that guy to death. Who do you think you are stealing from me? Right? But objectively, you can look at it and say, yeah, you know what? They shouldn't die because they were taking some of your property. Right? That's not just. And God gives us a conscience. He gives us a guide. And if you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit residing in you as well. It's going to help guide you in all truth. But we don't even need that guidance as much when we have just black and white what the law should be. I mean, it's written down. So let's check it out. Um, and I'm going to start off with some of the easier things in the law. Right? We're going to start small, start easy. That I think, and so we're, I'm going to be cherry picking. Right? I'm just letting you know, I'm cherry picking through the law, Leviticus 18, 19, and 20. That's where we find most of these, of these commandments. I'm not going to spend my time in the weeds with the, each specific one that people have a problem with yet, right? And, and not going to spend too much time in the sermon in general on each one individual. Let's just start with the easy stuff that I think everyone would probably agree, yeah, that's wrong and that should not be. Let's look at um, Leviticus 18 where we started. The Bible says in verse 6, None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. Now, uncovering the nakedness there is a euphemism. It's a clean way of, of just describing a, an act of a person lying with another person, right, carnally. So, and then, you know, in the, in the following verses, it's going to tell you, it's going to explain more specifically who is considered near of kin, Right? So, yeah, a brother and a sister shouldn't be lying carnally together. Is that really a difficult law to be like, oh, man, no way. That's so archaic. I can't believe you would want to have a law like that. Thankfully, today, I think the vast majority of people are still holding to this truth of going, yeah, that should be against the law. We really don't want to allow that in our society. But see, the reason that most people think they should be against the law, it, they don't have a foundation for that. It's just gross to them. It's just naturally weird. Or they may say, well, genetically, you know, it's gonna, it, you know if they have offspring, it's going to produce problems, which it will, and that's true, and that's a fact. That, that will cause problems, and, and you, have some, you have some very severe problems uh, um, defects in a, in, a, in a human being that's born from close relationships like that. But this goes into other relationships even outside of that, you know, kinship of, you know, through marriage and stuff too, where you're not going to necessarily have that genetic defect, but it's still wicked and wrong. So yeah, that should be against the law. How about verse number 21? The Bible says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. How about, you know, infant human sacrifice? To any God, I mean, to, to God, right? Molech. Passing through the fire? Yeah. See, if, if, I, if I were to preach here just, just all day saying, you know what? This isn't our law books. This needs to be against the law. No one should be allowed to pass their, you know, let their infant child just be killed on an altar and sacrificed to Molech. Is anyone going to be like, what are you doing trying to bring these archaic laws back into existence? No. Because it's still not acceptable today. You're not going to get any fight or pushback on that. 
No one's going to claim, oh, why are you going back to the law? Don't you know that's only for Israel? Getting ahead of myself again. Verse number 23. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie there, down there too. It is confusion. Bestiality. Yeah, that's, that's gross and disgusting and should be against the law. And again, the vast majority of people are going to say, yeah, we should have a law against that. How about Leviticus 19, 14? Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God. I am Lord. I, I don't think this is very controversial. Yeah, let's, let's, not, let's not curse deaf people and, 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 and make blind people fall by putting something in front of them so they fall down, right? It's, and I'm not going to get into all the spiritual implications of these laws. Look, this is just, I mean, these are still part of the law, right? Verse 15, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Again, yeah, it sounds good. We, don't, we shouldn't have this corruption going on where people just have preference because they're buddies and, and not actually give the right judgment in, in a matter. Sure. Verse number 17, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Sounds good. Verse 18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Hey, look at that. That's part of the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's part of the law. Oh, why are you going back to that Old Testament law, Pastor Burzins? Don't you know that's not for us today? Yeah, maybe we shouldn't love our neighbors ourselves. Verse number 29, do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore. Lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. Again, I don't think people have too much of a problem with that law, right? Leviticus 19.35, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in meat yard, in weight, or in measure, just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hin. Shall you have, I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. We have a whole department in our government for just measurements, right? They go out and they check the gas stations and anywhere we're using scales and you're, you know, you're, there's volume concern. That's how you're selling things to make sure no one's ripping you off, right? Makes sense. Yeah, we don't want people just, just, you know, ri ripping people off, saying, oh yeah, this is a pound, and it's not really a pound, it's like a nine-tenths of a pound or whatever, right? And then chapter 20, verse number 2, the Bible reads, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stone. So, in Genesis 18 and 19, we get more of like laws, and then we start getting into some of the penalties given for the laws. And someone murdering children by passing them through the fire, you know, there's a lot of people today who are getting soft on death penalty, but I think this is an instance where we can probably get a really large consensus of people going, yeah, that sounds like a good law to me. There's lots of other laws given. I don't want to keep belaboring this point. How about the Ten Commandments, right? Lots of good things there and that people won't have a problem with. But I'm not, you know, when nobody has a problem with things, there's not as much of a need to go over that stuff. But the reason why I bring this up is so that people can remember that when we go to other laws that might strike a nerve with people that all of a sudden people are going to get all upset about and go, oh, what are you doing going back to this? Don't forget about all the rest of the law here that you're fine with and you have no problem with and that some people would even say, well, the Bible says not to do this. The Bible says not to prostitute your daughter. And that would be a reason why Christians are going to give as to why something should be against the law. Yeah, we ought to put you know, child murderers to death. That's what the Bible says. And they have no problem with that. And they have no problem going back to the law when it suits their needs or their agenda or whatever they feel is right or wrong. But I'm sorry, hypocritical Christian, that doesn't want to go and embrace God's law for all truth. 
but you're a hypocrite if you can't go back and say, yes, this is righteous too. If you're going to go back here and use the Bible and say, no, you know, this is wrong and this is what the Bible says and that Bible, you know, my Bible says this and my Bible says that and you can't be just murdering kids. You're going to be put to death. Well, you know what? How about when we go through Leviticus 20 and we start seeing other things of people that ought to be put to death? Why are you getting quiet all of a sudden? Right? Why, why is it not, well, hey, this is what the Bible says. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Because you're brainwashed. Because you're desensitized. Because you don't actually want, you don't actually believe, or you just don't like it. So you're going to try to ignore it and be a hypocrite. But see, here's where people have the problem. Look at verse, in chapter 20. And there's many here that people are going to have a problem with. Verse number nine, for everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon him. Now, is there something morally wrong about, about a child cursing their father or mother? You better believe there is. And I'm not going to get too in-depth into this, you know, because this goes into what's a curse. You know, is it just a child getting mad at their dad or mom and just saying something stupid? No, cursing someone is a very serious matter, Right? Is it, is, it, is it a child going, I hate you? No, no, because that's not a curse. That's an expression of how you feel. That's not a curse. A curse would be like, I hope you die and go to hell. That would be a curse. Because when we see the curses of God in the Bible, that would be a curse. Uh, but again, I don't want to get too far just down on each. Because you can, you can spend a lot of time going into each one of these laws. And, it sh and I believe it should be done so we have a good understanding of what each one is talking about. But right off the bat here, people say, whoa, whoa, wait, I don't know about that. Why? Because that's not a law today. Why? Because increasingly kids are just getting more and more and more uh, disrespectful just overall. And this is becoming more and more of a problem and more and more people would be guilty of this. So, you, oh, wait, hold on a second. I don't know if I like that. How about verse 10? And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and adulteress shall surely be put to death. How about that one? Yeah, a lot of people are against adultery. Well, I don't know about putting them to death. Why? Just because you know so many adulterers? Or because you're an adulterer? Why? Why should we not have this be the punishment? Explain that. Why? If you're going to go back and say adultery is wrong because the Bible says so. And again, I'm talking to believers. People that don't believe the Bible can believe adultery is just fine all day long. And have their open marriages and whatever all the filth and wickedness that they do. That the heathen do. Because the heathen do that type of stuff. But you're a Bible believer. You believe adultery is wrong. You're setting up your own set of rules in a country. Are you going to make adultery against the law? If not, how do you justify that? When the Bible is so clear about not only the dangers of adultery, but that God made it a law. It's not good enough anymore. You say, okay, yeah, yeah, of course we're going to be against the law because, I mean, that's really wicked and really bad for someone to commit adultery against their spouse when you made a vow till death do us part and you're only going to keep each other. Yeah, of course, that's wrong. Okay, then how are you going to punish it? What are you going to do when someone breaks that law? What good is a law if you have no punishment at all? Well, they'll go to jail. Where do you get that from? Where does God mention jail as being a punishment for anything? Yeah. You're going to prison, son. Why would adultery today no longer be worthy in God's eyes of a person being put to death when it was then? What has changed in God's view towards 
this sin or any of the sins that we're going to go over? What, what's changed? Now, adultery is something that is, would be considered moral, right? Would fall under an umbrella of just, this is just wrong. It's morally wrong. And it's always been wrong and it'll always be wrong. This doesn't change with any times. And like I said, we're going to get into the changes. Because there were changes made to the law, but you know what? The changes don't apply to the moral laws. There's some things that are just right and wrong and always have been and always will be because it does not they don't fall any, under any other set of rules like the sacrifices do. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 11. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Right? And it continues and goes on and on with the death penalty here. Verse 13, if a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Okay, hold on there. No way. Can't go there. Why not? Talk about my servants. Let's reason together. I get slammed in the media and, you know, I, I bet there's people that would probably come to our church that don't. Because they see the news clip of, oh man, Pastor Burson, they put him in a dark light and they, they get this clip that just sounds so crazy and extreme. He believes, can you believe this? That he believes that, that you know, homosexuals should be put to death and executed. Yeah, oh man, what a hate preacher and everything else. We were doing just fine. No one had a problem. But we just kept reading our Bible. Why is this so different? Why should this be any different than anything else that we've been reading so far? Is sodomy still wrong? Yeah. yeah. Doesn't the Bible talk about that even in the New Testament? Being wicked and sin, it's abomination. And, you know, again, the Bible is pretty consistent. Actually, 100% consistent from front to back on God's view on this subject. Yeah. It doesn't change. So I'm going to have a country and I'm going to make up the laws. <coughs> We're going to make sodomy against the law? You're a Bible believer. I would hope so. What's the penalty for that? Maybe we should check with God. Because maybe, maybe your perception of sin isn't God's perception of sin. Maybe what you think isn't that big of a deal, God thinks is a huge deal. Right. And maybe you have gotten brainwashed along the way, and you've been desensitized, and you've allowed yourself to accept filth and wickedness and garbage, and to start thinking that this really isn't a big deal. Maybe you're the problem. Maybe it's not the Bible. Maybe it's not God. God doesn't change. God, the Bible says that God, I'm the Lord. I change not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't change. You know what changes? Society changes. You know how they change? For the worse. Cultures always go downhill. It's a law of entropy. Things are always falling into disorder and chaos and, and getting worse and worse. And morality is no different in human societies and cultures. They may start off good where God will bless somebody and bless a nation because they're doing the right things and they have good laws and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But in the end, it ultimately always will end up decaying and, and getting more and more wicked. But the truth doesn't change. Morality doesn't change. Let's reason together, O Christian. You've been fine with almost everything that I had said probably up to this point. Why is this a problem in your mind? What do you think is right and how do you justify what you think over what God said? 
And people who love the Lord seriously think about what I just said there and consider that. Are you more righteous than God? Do you know better? Well, yeah, it's a sin. Oh, that ought to be against the law. You can't see God saying anything different anywhere. In fact, when you go to almost the end of the Bible, you go to Jude, you go to 2 Peter chapter 2, and you know what you're going to find? After all this New Testament, we go through all of this. Yep, here we go. Oh, wait, I'm almost to Revelation. Verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the seas about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. Here's a reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at that. We're almost done with the... God, you made it almost to the end of the New Testament. What do you think about Sodom and Gomorrah? What do you think about sodomy now? Because things are so different after Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. Now... A man lying with a man is not an abomination anymore. Wait, what? Wait, well, how about we just read? Let's, just, let's see what God says about this, right? Because Christians today seem to think that, well, I mean, they love each other, right? Oh, well, it's a sin, but, you know, I mean, I sin too, and you sin too, and, you know, it's not a big deal. I mean, come on. I mean, should we really say anything about someone saying, I mean, who are you to judge? Let's see what God says. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the seas about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for what? Wait, an example. Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Hmm. Oh, yeah, it sounds like God really changed his mind on how wicked and abominable sodomy is, doesn't it? He really thinks different about it now. Yeah, I know in the Old Testament he said they ought to be put to death. But I mean, now we're in the New Testament, guys. Come on. Oh, wait. No, he used Sodom and Gomorrah as an example for people in the future who might think about doing the same thing to say, hey, look, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire out of heaven. Fire and brimstone and destroyed everybody and everything in it and made it a, a sulfur pile of ash. He gave up on them and destroyed them. There's your example, New Testament. Anybody. But this law, that, that's only for Israel. Wait, was Sodom and Gomorrah part of Israel? Were they, were they part of it? Were they one of the tribes? No. Then why would God destroy them? Hey, those laws, those are only for Israel, right? Oh, if you're going to go to the Old Testament law, that's, that was something that was only given to Israel. How many times have you heard that? Oh, we don't believe that because that was just given to Israel. Oh, see, you're going to you're going Leviticus law and you're, and, you're, and you're saying that people should, you know, Homosexuals should be put to death because that's what God said, but you don't even understand. You know, I was just giving Israel. So I guess God was unjust when he rained fire and brimstone down in Sodom and Gomorrah because he didn't give them that law, right? This is only Israel's law. Real consistent there. Sounds to me like you're trying to justify things and trying not to deal with things that God dealt with. Very clearly, all throughout Scripture. But I'm the crazy one. I'm the lunatic. I'm nuts. I'm the one that other believers are going to say, yeah, I mean, he's pretty extreme. Yeah, I'm pretty extreme. Pretty extreme because I believe Leviticus 20.13 and Leviticus 20.12 and Leviticus 20.14 and Leviticus 20.15. I'm extreme. I think you're extreme extremely brainwashed, extremely worldly, extremely influenced by the devil. Yeah. 
You can, I mean, we could keep going through this. Verse 14, if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, there, that there be no wickedness among you. A burning today, a Christian would be like, oh, no, we can't do that. That's not humane. Right? I mean, some people would advocate for death penalty, but be like, no, but we got to do, I mean, they got to get drugs. They've got to get put to sleep. It can't hurt them. You know, we're going to take their life away, right? We're going to kill them. But it has to be done this way because we're not, we're not barbarians, right? So I guess God's a barbarian then. Because God deemed it appropriate. Now, was everybody burned with fire on how they died? No. Nope. Some people were stoned. Stoned with stones as a death penalty. Some people were hung. Some people are burned with fire. What can we learn from that? We can learn how God thinks about these things. You know what this does? This helps us to understand how bad is this really? Because we live in a sinful world. We have sinful flesh. This is why, I mean... Don't you, I mean, I know I do, when you go out soul winning, bring up the fact that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Why do we do that? I'll tell you why I do that. I do that to explain to people who may think they're righteous in their own eyes that the sins that you've done are worse than you think they are. Because that's a problem that I had as a young, as a, as a child and a young adult, was thinking that, even though I knew I was a sinner, I wasn't really that bad. I don't, deserve, I, I don't deserve hell. I mean, I don't murder people. I don't rape people. I'm not going around stealing from people. Like, yeah, there was that one time where I took something. And, and, and you downplay it. Yeah, it just really wasn't that bad, though, right? Well, have you lied? Well, of course I did. But I mean, come on. If I didn't lie... I was going to get a beating or I was going to, you know, like if I didn't lie, I'd get in trouble for something, but it didn't really hurt anybody. I mean, all I did was, you know, break this and I made it right. And, and, but no one needs to know about that. Right. Yeah, make all the excuses you want, but you know, what's important is not how do you view the sin? It's how does God view the sin? So that's why we bring up that God saying, Hey, all liars deserve hell. Because it's that bad. Well, you didn't think it was that bad when it happened. You may still not think it's that bad. It doesn't matter what you think because if you're standing before God and all you've ever done was tell a lie and you didn't put your faith in Jesus Christ, he's going to send you to hell because it is that bad, whether you think it is or isn't. Whether you think things should be that way or they're not, that's the truth and that's the way they are. So whether or not you think that sodomy is that bad and you don't think that they should be put to death, the fact is, it is that bad. Whether you understand it or not, that's what God said. He's not changing his mind on this. It's still filth and wickedness, and that's still a just recompense of reward. And we need to understand this. Why do you focus on this stuff, Pastor Burzard? Why do you... I mean, we can't change the laws. We're such a minority. We're not going to convince people to do this. So why bother at all? Let's just focus on something else. No. Foolishness. That's what Satan wants us to do. Yeah, forget about all this righteousness stuff. Forget about that. How are we going to hate the evil and love the good and not let the evil cleave to us? And how are we going to not continue in sin? And how are we going to have a proper understanding of how bad sin is and how bad things are if we're not looking to the law, if I'm not preaching on these things? People are going to think it's not that big of a deal. But when God thinks it's such a big deal that he destroys an entire city over it, multiple cities, I think people need to be aware of that. Whether or not we could change the law you need to understand that God says it's death penalty. It's that severe. And yeah, you need to understand that adultery in God's eyes deserves death penalty. Yes, it's that severe. It's that bad. It's not just an affair, no big deal, everybody's doing it. No, it's wicked and you ought to be put to death for that. 
and go down the list. You want to see how God feels about all these different things that he's putting a death penalty on. We need to understand that whether or not we could actually change the laws. But here's the thing. What if you are in an opportunity to make a vote or whatever and shouldn't we know? Of course we should know. Foolish. There's so, so many foolish arguments against Oh, why do you preach on this stuff? Oh, why do you go back to the law? Oh, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Turn, if you would, to Hebrews 7. Because now I've gotten myself out of order. But key point, if we're going to be reasonable, key point. What do you do with the change in the law? Right? I already explained at the beginning how we're not trusting in the law for our salvation, so we can read a lot of verses that talk about that. That's not what we're believing. That's not what I'm teaching. I'm teaching we need to know what sin is. We need to know how bad things are. We need to know what's righteous and what's, and what's wicked. Right? How do we deal with that? Where does the change in the law come in? Hebrews explains very well the change in the law because there is a change. No doubt. Absolutely, there's a change in the law. But I'll tell you what, the entire law was not done away with. There was a change. There are some things changed. So let's look at what has changed. Because again, I told you before, I was cherry picking some of the laws when we're going through the law. And the ones that I cherry picked were ones, first of all, that, that pretty much everyone's going to agree with at the beginning. And also, I cherry-picked ones that are going to stand and haven't changed. Okay? There's some laws I didn't get into because you can argue that they have changed, and I would agree that some of them have changed. But what separates the ones that change from ones that don't? Hebrews 7, verse number 11, the Bible says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So there we see that there is definitely a change of the law. And what is he tying this to? He's tying it to a change of the priesthood. So in the Old Testament, the law came, was given to, Aaron, to Moses, to Aaron. You've got the priesthood. And then you have the Levites, the Levitical law. And the Levites' job were to do all of the service of the tabernacle, right? That was their job. And that's where the priesthood operated under. And what was the priesthood responsible for? Offering, sacrifices, all the duties of maintenance of the, the temple, right? Of the, the, the ark, of the, the uh, God's house. Flip over to chapter 9. And again, you know, read all of Hebrews, read Hebrews 7, 8, 9, and it's going to talk about Melchizedek and it's going to go into much further detail. This is still a higher level overview. This isn't digging in super deep where we're going to inspect every single law. It's something that you should do and you should know, but it's outside the scope of this sermon. Chapter 9, verse number 7. But into the second went the high priest only once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. He's talking about the high priest going into the holiest of holies to, to bring in the blood that's the atonement for the whole people, basically. Verse 8 explains this in more detail because that's what they had done. That was the practice. That's what the high priest did. Verse 8 explains it further to give us the understanding of the purpose of that. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The first tabernacle being the tabernacle in the Old Testament that the you know, children of Israel reared up. Verse number nine, which was a figure for the time then present. So this is something that was for that time. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So even back then, this wasn't the way to salvation. This wasn't going to just clear your conscience of all wrongdoing that you had done 
because you've offered a gift or a sacrifice. This, this didn't accomplish that. It never did and never could. But what it was doing was representing the way to have that clear conscience and everything. And this is a way that God taught the people and do that. And this is how he set it up. And he had priests and everything else to do all these things uh, to teach this. And he says in verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal. Carnal would be according to like the meat or flesh ordinances. Right? Not carnal in the sense of like, well, if you're sinful, you're carnal. This is carnal ordinances, meaning like, here's how you chop up a sacrifice. You, t you take the call above the liver, right? You take out the inwards, you wash them, you do this. These are carnal ordinances that they had to do. It was the law of God. They had a specific order for different sacrifices, how you do it when you wring the neck of the bird, you know, you, you, you pour out the blood, you let another bird, you know, all these things are carnal ordinances. And there's washings and there's meats and drinks and they ate stuff and they would drink things and, and they're all part of this ceremonial and, and Levitical order of, of running things through the priesthood imposed on them until the time of reformation. These things that were just mentioned in verse 10 are the things that changed. Because this was imposed on them until there's a reforming. That's what reformation is. You're reforming things. You're restructuring, right? We're restructuring that law, but it had to do with the Levitical priesthood, not with all of the law in general, not with thou shalt not kill. That's not a meat or a drink or a carnal ordinance or a washing. Okay, that wasn't representative of Jesus Christ going to the cross and being the lamb and being that offering and being that sacrifice. That's a moral law that's always been wrong. So while yes, there's a change to the law, what changed? The priesthood changed from the order of Aaron to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is Jesus Christ. Now there's a, a and that's why we don't offer animal sacrifices in any New Testament church today because because of that change in the law but as jesus said in matthew 5 and turn there if you would please matthew chapter 5 matthew 5 verse 17 we're going to start reading the reforming or, or, or reformation of the law is not an abolishment of the law if it was a total abolishment, then what we already started with wouldn't make any sense. Romans 6 wouldn't make any sense. Should we continue in sin? You know, sin is a transgression of law. That wouldn't make any sense. It was just a restructuring, a reforming of how things are to be done. The service of the tabernacle is no longer needed. No longer needed. So those laws concerning all of the service of the tabernacle, no longer needed. That tabernacle has been replaced. Jesus explains this, Matthew 5, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. So did he come to destroy the law or the prophets? Nope. Sure didn't. Is there a reformation? Yes. Did he come to destroy it? No. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Which is also why you see all the reasoning in Hebrews behind why the things have changed because it was a figure for the time then present, because all of those things were pointing to a savior. They're pointing to Jesus Christ. They were there representative of him. And after he came, he fulfills all of those things in his ministry on this earth, doing all the things that he was supposed to do, that he was prophesied to do, offering himself up as the burnt sacrifice, right? His blood being shed, his blood being sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven. All of that done was demonstrating, you know, everything that was done prior to that was pointing to that event of Jesus Christ. And once it's been done, it's been fulfilled, those laws are no longer necessary because now it's been done. Verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He's saying even the smallest part of the law is not going to fail. 
until everything's fulfilled. Because guess what? It hasn't all been fulfilled yet. And even after, yes, he's saying this while he was on this earth, before he died and, and resurrected, but even still, everything has not been fulfilled yet. We're still here. There's another coming of Jesus Christ. There's more to come. Everything has not been fulfilled. His earthly ministry has been fulfilled. Verse 19, whosoever therefore shall break, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. So a law that you think really isn't that important. It's just the least of the commandments. And shall teach men so. Oh yeah, you don't have to worry about that. Don't worry about that. That was just the law. That was just back then. Not a big deal. Who shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Sounds to me like we should be looking to the commandments and doing and teaching. Hey, we ought to look to this stuff. We ought to be following this stuff, even the least of them, even the things you don't think are that big of a deal. God values that as saying, you're going to be known as great in the kingdom of heaven if you do that. Now, if you do that in today's society, your name is going to be cast out as mud. People are going to ridicule you and hate you and, and make fun of you and whatever else. But isn't that what the world has always done to people who say, thus saith the Lord, and promote truth and promote righteousness? It's no different. It's no different. People need the truth today as much as they ever have. We shouldn't shy away from touching on these subjects. Oh, that's a sensitive subject. Oh, you, someone might have a homosexual as a, you know, a sibling or a relative or whatever, and you're going to offend that. Look, I didn't make them become a homo. And I didn't write this book. Are you going to accept it or reject it? Or are you going to be a hypocrite and accept the parts you like and reject the parts you don't like? Right. Flip back, if you would, to Leviticus. Look at verse Leviticus 24. I'm just going to deal with, with one last, uh, yeah, one last objection, because I, I kind of went out of order a little bit, but that's fine. I was going to deal with all the objections last, but it just kind of fit too easily in earlier. I already brought up the laws being only for Israel, right? Because, I mean, I hear that all the time. And it makes me want to bang my head against a wall or against the Bible going, why don't you just read and use some reason? Look at Leviticus 24, verse 17. I mean, I already brought up the fact that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, if the law is only for Israel, it didn't do them very much good. Verse 17, And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. And he that killeth a beast shall make it good, beast for beast. And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. And he that killeth a beast, he shall restore it. And he that killeth a man, he shall be put to death. Look at verse 22. So these are all things that are just power of the law that just make sense and that that's God's judgment on them. And this is this all righteous judgments for all of these things. Look at verse 22, though. You shall have one manner of law as well for the stranger as for one of your own country, for I am the Lord your God. Is God putting a difference between different peoples? Well, you're an Israelite, so this is going to be your law, but you're a Moabite that came here, so you're going to have your own different law because this is only for Israel. I mean, don't you understand? This is only for Israel. Why was there only one law for the people of Israel when there's strangers there or born in the land. That didn't matter to God. Hey, there's one manner of law. 
Why would someone who joined themselves on Israel be under that law? Let's say someone moves from another country. Well, that's only for Israel. No, there's one manner of law. It wasn't a good law for them when they lived somewhere else? Oh, yeah, that law was no good for you when you lived there, but now you're moving here, so now it's a good law for you. And I'm talking about in God's eyes, right? Obviously, when you move, you could be under different jurisdictions of who's making the laws and, and who's enforcing laws. But we're talking about right and wrong here because that's what the law does. That's what the law does. The law, I mean, the law is the one that tells you what lust is. Yeah. How should I have known? Except the law said thou shalt not covet. It tells you what's right and wrong. The law tells you covetousness is wrong. The law tells you these things are wrong because that's what the law does. There's one law that should be for everybody. God's law applies everywhere. That's why God cast out the people from before the children of Israel. Because they did the things that he said were wrong in his law. He judged them on his law even though they weren't Israelites. God judges the world on his law regardless of what nation you're of. And I'll tell you what, if America wants to keep promoting sodomy and keep embracing it and saying it's okay, then the United States of America is going to fall under God's law and judgment and be burned up just like Sodom and Gomorrah was. But those law, God, those laws were only for Israel. No. Oh. It's right and wrong, established by the Lord. And he doesn't need to repeat himself in the New Testament just to say, yep, I still mean that. Yep, I still mean that. Yep, I still mean that. Yep, I still... We don't need a repeat of the Old Testament in the New. If you don't see a change in the New, the Old sticks. I mean, that's what Jesus said. I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill. We know what he's fulfilled. It's clearly identified and, and written down. Everything else still stands. Just for Israel. Give me that garbage. So when you read through the Bible, I've got more. I'm not going to get into all the rest of it. It's already, we're already kind of going over time here a little bit. Back to the beginning. Let's reason together. How do you determine what's right and wrong? Do you look to people of the world? You're going to rely on lawyers? You're going to rely on just, well, I mean, this is what we do because we need to have all these, you know, and, and one last point, I want to bring this up too. You know, we put out a movie, a documentary on like censorship and stuff like that. You know, freedom of speech, which I do believe in, but still only to a point. Because I'm still consistent with the Bible. And when the Bible has laws against cursing God, I believe there ought to be a penalty for that. Yeah. Hey, you're free to say it, but guess what? There's a punishment for that. I believe that. I believe that should be the law. You believe in a theocracy then? I believe in biblical law. I believe in what God said is right. If you want to call that a theocracy, I don't care what you call that. I call it going to God for what's right and wrong. Going to the Holy Bible as our law book that should be established by men of understanding that can just show the differences between the Old Testament and New Testament law, which are very easy to see. That's right. And if we had a righteous government and a righteous land, that would be the law. All of it. Not cherry pick, but just the, the ones that are, that are not under the Levitical priesthood that would still stand today, that should be the law. How would you, that's how I would make the laws. If I had Burzen's land, you know, in some island, this would be the law of the land. I think it's important for Christians to know that and believe that. I think we need to know how God feels about things and trust that, that this is righteous judgment. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, providing us with truth.
and wisdom and knowledge. And I pray that you would please help us to be able to understand righteousness, understand morality, understand right and wrong based on your word, on the truth, and not on philosophy of men and just what people kind of think or feel, but that we would look to you for all sorts of, of truth and information and knowledge on what is right and wrong and, and you know, how bad things really are. We, we need to understand that and know that so that you know, when things are, are so bad they deserve a death penalty, Lord, we ought to have nothing to do with that and not even come close. I mean, that, those are extremely wicked sins and we're going to learn that from your law and I pray that you would please help us to be able to show other people who are believers in your word just the reasonableness of this, that, that this is what you're teaching and what you're showing us, dear Lord, and help us to be influential people around us and, and to be able to bring people closer to you and that we could have more people living righteously and understanding and knowing the difference between good and evil, dear Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.